Good morning. You're probably wondering about the title, Covetousness, the Deadly Sin That Doesn't Exist. It, it sounds contradictory, and, it, and it's, it's not meant to be literal. The reason for the title is I've been in a lot of different churches, different kinds of churches. I have never in my life known of anyone who has been excommunicated or disciplined or asked to step down as, as a, you know, from deacon or bishop or whatever because they were covetous. I mean, I mean, I've never heard of someone being disciplined for being covetous. I mean, it must not exist. I, I, I don't know. Or maybe I lived in a shelter world. Have any of you, raise your hand, have you been in a church where someone, you knew someone was disciplined? Yeah, they were covetous. So it's like, uh, as uh, Anabaptists, you know, most of our churches have um, st written standards that, you know, we, we discuss various things like entertainment or uh, dress, things like that, and we define that. Uh, most, I've seen all kinds of different Mennonite Amish standards. They don't usually... Say anything about covetous? That you know, this is how we define covetous. It, it's uh, there's no uh, nothing there, which is why I'm wondering: is there such a sin? I mean, we we, we, we treat it as if it doesn't doesn't exist at all. So maybe it's just one of these little ones. It's it's just not a deadly sin. It's just something doesn't matter uh, if you're guilty of it. Um, no, no big deal, because because it doesn't matter. Well, I mean, the way we handle it, you'd think that that yeah, just it must either be be something like you know telling a white lie or or, or whatever. Um, it's if it's around, it's it's not something any any of us have to worry about. But let's see what the scriptures say. I'm not going to read all all the passages. Let's just look at some of them. First Corinthians five eleven. But now I've written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or an extortioner, not even to eat with such a person. So we're not supposed to eat with this person, but he doesn't exist. <laughs> I mean, you know, no one is ever, you know, labeled as covetous, um, but he's saying don't eat with that such a person. Okay, don't eat with him, but, but who is he? What, it, does, it doesn't seem to exist. We don't, we don't talk about our churches. No, no one's ever, uh, you know, I've heard of people being disciplined for being drunkards or sexually immoral, but I've never heard uncovetous. Paul says again, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Now, right now, we are citizens of God's kingdom if, if we are part of Christ's body. But we haven't inherited the kingdom. We're citizens. We're subjects of it. But that doesn't mean we're going to necessarily inherit it just because we're a subject right now or a, a citizen. Uh, that's, that's at the end of our life. And Christ is going to decide whether we're going to inherit it, whether we're, we're going to be a part of this kingdom uh, for eternity or if it's just, yeah, something for a few years that we... Uh, call ourselves a, a member of it. He says, do not be deceived. So it's like, okay, apparently we're likely to be deceived that, oh, it's okay. In fact, what do most churches teach today? Well, sin doesn't have anything to do with whether you're going to inherit the kingdom of God, whether you're going to have eternal life. Your works have no role in salvation. It's, yeah, it's all grace. So, I mean, that's why he's saying do not be deceived. The Holy Spirit knew what would be being taught later on in saying, do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous again. Uh, look who a covetous person is linked in with. Uh, I mean, all of these other sins that we would say, yeah, that's a deadly sin. 
If, if you're guilty of that, you're not repentant. I mean, no, you're not going to inherit God's kingdom. Our churches would say that. I mean, like I say, plenty of other churches would say, no, it, it doesn't matter. And that's who he links covetous with, nor drunkards, nor revilers. A reviler is, there's not just one good English word. If you think of somebody who's uh, foul-mouthed, loud, uh, complainer, um, always telling people off, that's a reviler nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. So he had already said, don't eat with such a brother. And then he repeats it again in the same letter. You know, in case you didn't get it, you know, let me say it again. Don't be deceived, you know. These people will not inherit the kingdom of God. And like I said, most of these, yeah, we know what they are. And we would have no question. Covetous, what's that? You know, who's that? It must must be a person who doesn't exist because, like I say, nobody is ever put out of a church. No one's ever disciplined. No one's ever anything. Ephesians 5, 5 through 6. For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of God, of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. So here again, it's, I mean, it's clear this is a deadly sin. You will not inherit the kingdom of God. But I mean, it's a sin, like I say, we just generally don't ever talk about in church. Like, just somehow it doesn't exist. If You know, if it did exist, you wouldn't inherit the kingdom of God. But, you know, don't worry, it doesn't exist. <laughs> I'm being facetious, but I mean, obviously... It does exist. It's something we are supposed to be very on guard about, and we have all of these warnings in scriptures. Um, but yeah, we just it, it just kind of goes. It's like, well, yeah, whatever it is, none of us ha- have an issue with it. I think we deceive ourselves if 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 we think that. Now, again, I don't think it's my place, and I'm not going to get up here and and say, okay, you know. You, you, and you, you know, you're, you're covetous. I can't read people's hearts. And uh, I'm just going to give you some thoughts today for, I think, all of us to look at our own hearts and ourselves and see if maybe we are covetous because it's a deadly sin. In other words, we, we don't want to fool around with it. We don't even want to be in the gray area. We, we want to make sure, get as far away from that edge of the cliff as, as you can that this exists, it's going to cost us eternity. So, yeah, let's not see, well, I can get this this close to it. Let, let's just get as far away from it a, as we can. So what does it mean to be covetous? If, if we don't even know what it means, then obviously we can't be on guard against it. Now, um, Andre gave a, a message last year on it, you may remember, and he talked about uh, covetous, probably if you were going to come up with one English word that would come closest, it would be envy, and that is, is one aspect of covetous. But being covetous is multifaceted. It's, it's like, you know, a gem that, you know, has been cut on, on different sides that, that it's not just one aspect. So envy, if you're envious, then yes, you're definitely covetous. Those, those go hand in hand. Um, some Bibles, and I would disagree with this, some of the modern translations, they they don't use the word covetous. They, they translate it as greedy. Well, a, a greedy person, yes, I think, would be covetous. But it, it's more than that. I, I don't like that because greedy, well, I think a lot of people say, well, I'm not greedy. And, and yeah, it, it would seem like, okay, we're all, we're all off the hook. Now, when I was preparing this and looking at all the, I just did a search you know, uh, on my computer Bible for covetous, you know, and all the verses that deal with it or covetousness both. And um, if you're from the South, it's covetousness. But uh, anyway, in case you're wondering what I'm talking about and you're from the Deep South, we're, yeah, we're talking the same thing. Okay, so covetousness. I noticed Hebrews, this, this verse, I, I've read it many times, never thought about maybe the significance of it. But I, I wonder if this would be a good definition if we were going to try to define it. Let your conduct be without covetousness. So he gives us a command again, let it be without covetousness. And then he adds, be content 
with, with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. In other words, you can be content because God is watching over you. He is not going to desert you uh, or, or leave you helpless. But going back to that, be content with such things as you have. Okay, he is saying that because if you're covetous, it means you are not content with the things that you have. So maybe if you were to give a, a, a definition, I think uh, being discontent with the things that you have would maybe be a way to define covetous. It, it would embrace envy and greed and, and many of these other things. But if you are discontent with the things that you have, and that gets a little scary. Yeah, how many of us are just, we're content with, with what we have? I mean, Paul says this, and every time I read it, I think, who are we? For we brought nothing into this world. We know who that is. That's all of us. And it is certain we, that's all of us, can carry nothing out. No problem there. And having food and clothing with these, we shall be content. Really? Is it the same we? <laughs> Are we content with food and clothing? I mean, he doesn't even mention shelter there because Paul himself never owned a house as far as, as, far as we know. He, I mean, God always saw that he had shelter. Often it was in a prison, but, but he always did have shelter. Um, but I notice, I mean, w with food and clothing, he said, with these we shall be content, assuming that, yeah, if you're a Christian, you're content with, with food and clothing. And I think if we are all honest, probably none of us are. I mean, we want more than just that. I think I would be dishonest. Now, that's not a, he's not saying you're covetous if you want more than that, thankfully. But he's saying, you know, we should be content with that. But, yeah, going back, and I don't know if I can go back. Yeah, I made it. Be content with such things as you have. So uh, we'll go there. We won't, we're not going to say if you, if you want something more than food and clothing, you're covetous. I, I'm not going to make that claim today. But it's something to think about. That verse is in there for a reason. And so he's saying, you know, this is really all you have to have. I mean, you need shelter, obviously, but um, you don't even necessarily have to own that, and many people don't. Um, but, you know, th that's to live, you have to have food, you have to have clothing, well, modesty, and also, uh, unless you're in a very hot climate, in order to not die from exposure. But being content with the things that, that you have, now, I think you all know what that is, that's a, a medieval castle, now, if, if you read fairy tales or grew up with, you know, folk tales, um, whatever, or, or just have, have read history, now picture a king or queen who, who lived in one of those castles in the Middle Ages that, that everybody would have thought, wow, this is the ultimate in, in life. I mean, the people who lived back then, it's like, wow, if they can't be happy, who, who can be? I mean, they've got... They've got everything. Now, that king or that queen living back there in the Middle Ages, they, they didn't even begin to approach the comfort level that everyone here has. I mean, those castles are pretty. I mean, they're magnificent to look at. I mean, they were cold and drafty. I mean, you know, there was no central heat. <laughs> you, you know, I mean, they had fireplaces all over. If you've ever had to depend on a fireplace as your only means of heat, yeah, I mean, it, it works. Uh, you're going to have a lot of cold spots in your house. you got a house that big. I mean, that's going to be <laughs> cold everywhere. There's no way you're, you're going to build something like that and it not be drafty. They didn't have the means of engineering that, that we do. Uh, lots of times they wouldn't have even had glass in the windows. And... 
uh, I mean, that's just a start. You know, of course, in the summer, there's no, no way to, to, uh, to cool it. It probably was a bit cool just because it was large. But uh, you had rats, mice. I don't care how, you know, you were the omnipotent king. I mean, your castle, I guarantee you, was full of mice, rats, cockroaches, you know, in insects, whatever. That They had no way to keep th those kind of creatures out. Um, no, I mean, no uh, refrigerators. Um, you know, if they wanted something cold, I mean, you know, sometimes they kept snow for a while or, or ice, you know, in, in certain things. But, I mean, that was, boy, that was limited. Nothing like, I mean, we just, boy, we've got refrigerators. I think probably everyone here, you a refrigerator, you just uh, can have, you know, anything cold. You want something hot, instant, just stick it in a microwave. Uh, there you have it. Uh, I mean, you could go on, on and on. I mean, think of transportation. I mean, you look at the carriages that the kings and queens rode in, and, and yeah, they look magnific magnificent. Uh, they're all, you know, painted with gold and fancy scrolling on it, and they would have, you know, white horses all, I mean, you know, very pretty to, to, to look at. If you think riding in one of those carriages was anything near the comfort level that you and I drove to church this morning, <laughs> you're imagining things. I mean, there was no way to heat, heat it, so if it was winter, you were in there, yeah, with a bunch of rugs, blankets, whatever, furs to, to keep you, you um, warm. But it's going to be drafty. There's no way to keep the, the air from, you know, coming in there. In the summer, absolutely no way to cool. You put the windows down. You're, there's no paved roads, except maybe in, the, in, in a few of the cities. They had cobblestones. But, you know, most, most places you would travel, you're traveling in dirt. In the summer, the horses are kicking up dirt. Um, there's going to be, you know, <laughs> smells of manure, what, uh, whatever, insects flying in and out. I mean, and I don't know what kind of shocks those carriages had, but nothing like you and I have on, on our cars. So you're bumpy, it's hot, it's dusty. Uh, I mean, they would have just, they couldn't even picture what you and I have of just, well, just being able to walk out and push a button. If you're in Quinn's car, you don't, you just... Go ahead and drive, drive off, you know, and and um, you know if, if it's cold outside, I mean, not only do you have you know instant warmth, you can get it, you know, the temperature that that you want. Uh, some cars, I don't have one, you know, you can heat your seat, you know, so that your your seat is warm. Uh, in the summer, probably most of us have air conditioning. Man, you can get it down to you know. Uh, whatever temperature you want, uh, you want to hear a choir? Yeah, just you push a button. Yeah, you get to hear a choir while while you're traveling. Uh, very little bumpiness on on most of our roads. I mean, those are just a couple things. I mean, that like I say, we live at a level of comfort today that uh, kings and queens didn't have back then. Now, if you told just the average peasant living in the Middle Ages, now imagine that there would be a time when someone of your class, not the kings and queens, but, but just the ordinary person, that, that you'd live in a house, that the whole house would be warm e e everywhere. You wouldn't have to bring in firewood unless you wanted to. Um, but um, uh, anywhere in the house, it, it would be warm. And then when summer came... Guess what? You could dial it back to spring in your house and, and have the temperature that, that, that you want, just, just the way that, that you want it. Um, you want something cold? Yeah, you, you'd have a, a magical box there. You can open up and just, you know, get cold things out. You could store things in. You'd eat meat not once a week, but, you know, every day you'd get to eat meat. Probably two meals a day, maybe three meals a day you'd have meat. I mean... I don't know if kings had, had that back in at that time. And then you describe to them the uh, kind of travel that just the ordinary person would, would have, not to even mention things like, you know, if you wanted to talk to your neighbor, instead of walking over there, you can just pick up a device and, and talk to them. Uh, you have a device that does this or that. Instead of taking a cold shower, yeah, you can just 
<laughs> turn on it, so automatically just the water that comes out is is warm. You get it just exactly the temperature that 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 you want. I mean, they would have thought, well, I mean, that's not like heaven. I, I mean, <laughs> if you. If you <laughs> If someone lived in an age where they really had all of those things, well, everybody would be happy. I mean, how, how could you how could you not be happy? I mean, I mean, like everything around you. But see, the problem is you could call our age the age of plenty. I think that'd be a good description. We live in the age of plenty. We also live in the age of discontent. I think you could call it that. I would say that this century is probably the most discontent of any century, perhaps since human history. I mean, people, all of this has been given us. Like I say, we get to have, you know, quote, heaven on earth. Um, and instead of it being that, people are not just all happy and content. They're discontent. I mean, they're further from Hebrews than they were back in Paul's day, you know, when he when he wrote that, assuming Paul's the, the writer of Hebrews, that... Uh, be content with the things that, that you have. I mean, yeah, most of them would have come a lot closer than us today when we've, we've got all of these things that they couldn't have even envisioned. They, they, they wouldn't have even believed that was possible to have that level of comfort, to have every need met, and then all these things that aren't needs but comforts that they're met as well, and then things even beyond that just to make life even extra convenient, extra whatever, that, that that is there. And if we told them, yeah, you know, there was an age when everyone had that, and guess what? It was an age when there was so much discontent and unrest. And, and, and why is that? Because I'm not happy because you've got something more than I've got. Yeah, all my needs are met. All my comforts are met. I've got, I've got all of this stuff, but I'm not happy because I think there's somebody out there who's got more than I've got. And I don't think that's right, that they have more than I have. And so I'm discontent, and that's covetous. I, I'm not happy because somebody else has got something, or I imagine they've got something more than I have, and therefore, yeah, I'm discontent, disgruntled, unhappy. Just less than a month ago when I was in Honduras and... Um, I was sitting there chatting with, with uh, a friend of mine, a Honduran friend, and, and she was just, she was just like talking about uh, uh, Americans, like, wow, what a strange group of people that they've got more than everybody on earth, uh, more rights, more wealth, more conveniences, more whatever you want to name it. They're always complaining. I mean, that's what that's what the world. They're you know when they see America, yeah, always complaining always out there demonstrating, writing about something, you know, just, and it was just so strange to her. It's like, wow, here in Honduras, we, we don't have a fourth of that. And doesn't mean everyone in Honduras is happy, uh, but nothing like the, the just endless unhappiness in the United States. You know, as the scriptures say that a lover of silver is, um, is never going to be happy with with silver, it's just, it's an unending thing. That's the problem with being covetous. You are not content with what you have. And if you get more, you're not going to be content then. You're going to, well, if I just had a little bit more. I mean, don't imagine that billionaires sit, are, are just there like, wow, I, I don't need anything more. There's nothing more that I want. No, you know, don't imagine that those kings and queens in the Middle Ages were content with what they had. No, they wanted more. I mean, you you read the history of those times, it's just like <sighs> endless war. And the wars were mainly because, yeah, I want the land that somebody else has. I want whatever, you know, uh, they've got that I don't have. And uh, so I'm unhappy. I, I uh, search for things I can read at night uh, that that are uh, hopefully boring to help me go to go to sleep and and. <laughs> so often it just doesn't end up being one. But uh, I, I got a book, it's public domain, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. Um, it's It was written, I don't know when, way back in the Middle Ages, and uh, certainly not anyone trying to make it anything sound interesting. Just, I mean, it's what it says, a chronicle of, you know, what was happening back in 
Anglo-Saxon England. So this would have been before the Norman Conquest. So like in the 900s, 800s, those those years. And it's like, I mean, just every page is, yeah, this king is, is gone up against these kings. I mean, the Angles and Saxons, they come and take somebody else's land, you know, from the Britons. They steal their land from them and they settle there. But then they're not happy. No, I, you know, oh, so-and-so, he's got a little bit more than I do, you know. And so it's just... It's every page you go to. I'm thinking maybe the next page, you know, you get to hear something, uh, you know, that sounds good. No, no, ne- next page, there's, it's another king, another queen. They're fighting. They're, they're waging war against their neighbor on and on and on and on. It's just like, wow, cannot be content with, with what you have. Okay, so why do churches not enforce this command? Why don't we we hear more on it? Why don't we uh, ever see discipline? Why is it not in our church standards as a normal thing? Well, I think probably the main reason, it it is often a sin of the heart. It's not something that's necessary. I don't don't know what is in your heart, and I I don't necessarily, um, certain things might, indicate you're not content with what you have, but, but I, I don't just, I can't read your heart, you know, and just, uh, you know, know that for sure. I mean, you know, if Radford and I are walking in the parking lot, you know, I'm not going to look at Radford and say, Radford, are you coveting my Prius? <laughs> you, you know, <laughs> fess up to it, you know, I mean, uh, you, you know, I mean, he may or may not. I, I mean, how, <laughs> we don't have any way to of generally knowing that. So that's one of the problems why it's it's very hard because it, it is a, a sin that is not as readily manifest as, say, sexual immorality or drunkenness, you know, so, something like, like that. The other thing, it's difficult to define the speci- specific parameters. I mean, the Bible doesn't give us just, you know, uh, this, okay, you've crossed the line here. You know, we have, I think, like I say, that, that, that uh, definition... Be content with what you have, but yeah, what shows you're not content with what you have? I mean, does that mean you can't buy something more? Does that mean you're covetous if you buy another car, buy another that? I, I don't think that that necessarily means that, that you're covetous. What I'm going to do is suggest three practices that I believe God looks upon as covetous. Now, I'm mentioning these as personal guidelines, and these are my thoughts, okay, to look at yourself, each and, and me look at myself. Uh, I'm not proposing these are as laws or rules. Uh, it just, either we come back to the title that it's a deadly sin, but it doesn't exist. You know, <laughs> covetousness, it, it doesn't exist. Or we come to the realization it does mean something. I mean, there, it, it is something, okay? So here's some things that I would just say, we're getting close to the brink here. Now, again, I'm, I'm not saying this in judging anyone. Okay, revolving credit card debt. You may not be familiar with that term. So we all know what credit cards are. And we all know what credit card debt is. That means you, you owe money on a, on a credit card, okay? I'm, I'm not suggesting there is anything wrong with that. I, every month, I owe money on a credit card. I, I've almost quit using money in, anymore, and I use credit cards for almost everything that I buy. At the end of every month, I pay off the total balance. In fact... I've got it set up where it's automatically paid off. It's going to be drafted from my bank account, and and uh, uh, we make sure we don't spend more than what's going to be there to when it's drafted. So I, I don't even have to worry. It's going to automatically be be paid off at the end of the month. I, I'm not suggesting uh, in any way there's anything wrong with with um, with that. But revolving credit card debt is when, yeah, you're not able to pay off the whole balance at the end of the month. Uh, now, from the credit card company's perspective, that's not bad. That, I mean, <laughs> they don't like people like me. I mean, that's, that, you know, they haven't benefited. They've benefited a little bit because they get money from the merchants. So, yeah, they're benefiting from, from my purchases. But, yeah, they want, they want um, the people who don't pay off the whole balance at the end of the month. So revolving credit card debt is when 
yeah, every month you pay the minimum or you maybe pay a little bit and then you just you go right back and charge again. And so you, you it just it, you've always got that that balance there that you owe that you carry from month to month. It revolves is why it's called revolving. This is a big problem in, in the United States. I mean, the richest country on earth. I mean, like I say, we have all of this and people want more than what what they have. And um, the average credit card rate of interest is 20, you know, as of the end of of last year, 20.4%. That's the average. Now, 20%, that would mean in five years, if if you keep revolving your data, in five years, you would pay double whatever the price of everything that you've charged if you carry debt for five years, then you just you just paid twice as much for for that object. Uh, and, and like I say, it's a way of life with so many people. Just yeah, just just keep and 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 it's like credit card companies love that because I mean they're just making this gigantic windfall uh, off of most of the the ones in the United States. I mean, well, like I say, it's forty one percent of the households. Again, I'm not suggesting it's a sin to purchase things with a credit card, or, or I'm definitely uh, a huge sinner, you know, standing up here. I, I don't. Now, it can be dangerous. Some people, yeah, just don't need to have credit cards because they they can't control it. So, yeah, if you can't control it, then I then I would say, yeah, uh, it's gonna it's a tool of covetousness. Just just yeah, stay away from it. But if you can control it, then like I say, it is particularly if you're purchasing things online, it's, it's you know, about the only way you can buy them. But what I think God looks on as covetous is buying a non-necessity when you don't have the money to buy it. In other words, it's not a necessity. You can live without it. And, and I'm going to be very generous here. I'm going to include you know, a, a washing machine, a microwave, a refrigerator is necessities, and they're not, you know, car. I mean, just the things that we Americans have gotten used to. I, I'm not even talking about those things. I, I'm just talking about things that are just, yeah, they're nice to have, and you don't have to have it. Eating out, you know, uh, fancy cell phones. I mean, you can get different kinds of, of cell phones, but having to have the, the top one, Whatever Americans spend their money on, I mean, there's so much out there that you can have. Now, I'm not suggesting that if you have the money, it's it's wrong to buy something you don't have to have. What I'm suggesting that I think God is going to look on as covetous, and, and again, I'm not saying this to judge anyone. I'm saying this that my fear is God is going to judge you, okay, that, in other words, how are you going to be able to say, I'm content, I was content with what I had, but I went out and bought something I didn't even have the money to buy, and I didn't have to have it. It wasn't a necessity. But I just went out and bought it anyway. I mean, can you really argue then, oh, I was content with what I had, that, that you're buying things? It's not a necessity. It's not even what an American considers a necessity. But, yeah, I just had to have it. I couldn't wait until I could save up enough. i got to buy it right now. Again, not saying that to judge anybody, but just look at your heart. I mean, covetous has to mean something. I mean, if, if, you know, if we're not content as Americans and we've got to buy things we don't even have money to buy, and we're even willing to pay absurd rates of interest, 20%, you know, like I say, every five years, you're doubling the cost of, of things. I would suggest... Yeah, take take a deep look, have a talk, husband and wife, and and just yeah, take a, take a look at your life. I mean, when when we had a house church, well, it grew into a, a building church um, in Texas. I was just sort of shocked because uh, being older than than everyone here except a couple people there in the back. Dan's got me beat by a year, I think, or two, whatever. Uh, but you didn't have, see, when, when I was a boy, you didn't have credit cards. You didn't have bank credit cards, okay? Visa, MasterCard, th- those weren't around, okay? You could get a gas station credit card, like Exxon or something like that, and when you bought gas there, you know, you, you couldn't use it other places. You could just buy 
gas, and then the end of, end of the month you got a bill, and and you you know paid your your uh, for your gasoline. My parents had one. It's kind of a little convenient. You didn't ha- you know didn't get stuck in case you didn't have money on you. But that was pretty much it. And I, I remember when Visa and Mastercard first came along. You know, and like. Oh, you, you can just go to any store and use this. I mean, that that was a, a real novelty. Well, like I say, that was you know in the in the sixties. Well, then just uh, by the nineties. I mean, flip ahead twenty five years or something. Our church in Texas, we had all of these people. They didn't come from Anabaptist backgrounds. They just came from you know seekers out there. I mean, I would say. To my, rec- my recollection, every single person who came to our church, every single family, with the exception of the Dean Taylor family, they're, they're, they were the only ones, uh, came with their credit cards maxed out. I, I mean, they had, they had used them to the hilt. And so now, now all they were doing is paying the minimum amount and paying all, all, all of that, that credit and yet still wanting things all the time. So they never paid it down because there was always something more that they wanted, that, that they had to get. And then, of course, if you're living that way without any margin, that, you know, everything is to the limit, you're spending every penny that, that you get, uh, you have, you know, extended all your credit. Well, yeah, so what are you going to do when your car breaks down? What are you going to do when you have a medical expense? Yeah, you, you're, you're in a bind. So then, you know, you're asking the church, hey, you, you know, I, I can't do this, okay? And I'm not saying this, you know, like to, for someone to hesitate to ask the church for help. I'm, I'm not saying in that context. I'm just saying that lifestyle, we had a whole church that that, that was everybody. I mean, it was everybody in the congregation, like I say, with, with, with one exception. And so it was, it was like, you know, all of the kingdom money that, you know, I mean, there are so many millions, maybe billions in the world uh, of people who, um, I mean, literally go hungry. I mean, an American has no idea what hunger is. They know what it means. Oh, I'm hungry. I want to eat something. Hunger. That, that yeah, you don't have enough food to even give you the calories you need e- each day. Uh, the, the needs are so great in so many parts of the world and what I saw was, so all of this money that I'm giving to God's kingdom is just going to my fellow Americans because they're covetous, that they're not content with what they have. They spend more than what they have, and we're always having to bail them out as, as a church because they're in this bind and, and that bind. And it's the only good thing that came out of that was the ministry I'm involved in with Honduras. You know, I, I finally just threw up my hands. I'm going to get involved in a country where I know people are poor, and, I, and I'm going to help them because I'm, I'm sick and tired of, of yeah, just uh, Americans who have so much just wanting more and more and not wanting to use discipline and uh, really just, I don't know any other, I don't know a polite way to say it. They're covetous. It just got to have more. Got to always have more. I remember when cell phones first came out. I mean, I'm really dating myself here. You know, most of you is like, you mean they haven't always been here? Uh, and they were the flip tops. I mean, you couldn't do all. I mean, now a cell phone is more like a mini computer. They they were just a phone, and it was like, well, that's an, a new thought. Um, like, what? Why do we have to have those? You know, I mean, yeah, I could see a few things handy when when I would go into town, run an errand. Deborah would always say, you know, call me before you come home and see if there's something you know I've thought of that I'd like you to pick up. And she was, you know, super good at that. You, you, know, you just went, now in those days, it were pay phones. It cost you a quarter. You just put in, you just stop somewhere and call. You know, okay, I'm on my way home. Is there anything else you need? You know, or, and she would do the same. And that was it. You know, it cost you a quarter and, and it got, but it's like, yeah, when you left home, no one was going to bother you. You didn't have to worry about anything. You weren't going to get, you know, a bunch of messages about this or that. You were, you were free, you know, until you, 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 you got back home, you know. And so it was like, well, no, it's nothing wrong with a cell phone, but yeah, why? Why? I don't, you know, I don't have to have one of these. We were living on a strict budget our, ourselves, so it's like, yeah, we, we can pass on that. But every all these people in the church, no money, you know, always, yeah, I gotta have this or that. Every one of them, I mean, boom, boom, boom. You know, we were the last ones in our church to get a, to get cell phones. I mean, it's like, 
It's just like, oh, got to have the latest thing, got to have this, you know? Do you have money for it? No, I just, so I just go and, and I go into, into debt, you know, further, further debt. And then I want kingdom money to get me out, out of that, which then I'm taking money out of food out of the, the mouth of somebody, some part of the world that I'll never meet, not in, not in this life. I might meet them on judgment day. I, I don't know. And it was just like, I mean, this is just insane. Just people who, who just have to have something more, you, you know. Again, nothing wrong with cell phones. If you got the money to, I, I own a cell phone now, you know, but um, it's not a, a necessity. If you're going to have to go into debt uh, to do it, um, one of the families in our congregation, um, he was wanting some help from the church. It's very ironic because he made more than anybody in the church. Um, he made a considerable more than I did and more than any, anyone else. I mean, you, you know, he, he would have, was like, um, and so he had asked if we could talk, to, you know, about, you know, could the church help them out of their, you know, get out of their, some of their problems and, and, and all of that. So I said, well, let's, you know, let me come over, set, set a date. And, and, and I, went, I drove to his house. Um, he was there alone. It was a, a very nice day, um, and, we, and we said, oh, let's, let's go to the park. There was a park close to his house, and we can, uh, yeah, we can chat there. It'll be pleasant. We can kind of walk. We, and, and so, you know, we got in my car, and uh, I started driving. I saw, oh, man, I'm on empty. So I said, yeah, let, let me pull in the gas station. So I pulled in, and I'm, you know, filling up my car. And when I get through, I get back in, and, and he's gone. I th- oh, he probably had to go to the restroom. You know, he, he went in the gas station, so... You know, I just sit there and wait. Well, he comes back out. He's got this great big drink. He's got like giant candy bars that I've never seen him that that big. Uh, <laughs> chips. I mean, it was just like <laughs> I, I just like and and okay. You want to talk about you don't have, <laughs> you need money because you don't have money. And it's like you know I don't have money when I go to a gas station. I don't go inside. I don't, I mean, I'm talking about then, and it's the same, it's true now. I mean, you know, unless I have to pick up milk or, you know, something like, like that. And it's like, why? We just left your house. I mean, if you were hungry, yeah, we could have had some, you could have had free food there. We just, I mean, like literally three minutes ago, we're at your house. And it's like, so th- th- yeah, this is the problem that you think you've got to just spend money that you could have something a little bit less, you know? Just not content with what you have. And like I say, he lived in a uh, very nice place, um, you know, had all of, a bunch of creature comforts that, that I, I certainly did, didn't have. And, yeah, so we, we had a long talk about <laughs> <laughs> this problem of learning to be content with what you have and that, yeah, you got yourself in this mess and you're going to have to be willing to... Go through some unpleasantness, you know? If everyone always bails you out, then, yeah, you, you never have tasted that, okay, you know, I spent money I didn't have, and so, yeah, it's going to be unpleasant. It means for a while I'm going to have to go through a period of not getting very many of the, you know, extra perks I would like to have until I get this paid off and, and you know, maybe cut up my credit card because... Yeah, I'm just not able to to control myself. Um, I, I I don't know. So that would be one thing. You know, I would just suggest if you are buying non necessities, even when you don't have the money to buy them, you're willing to go into debt to buy something you don't have to have and you don't have the money for. I'm going to suggest you probably have a problem with being covetous. Okay, I'm not going to sit here and judge you. I'm just going to say. Boy, take a hard look at yourself. All right, N- number two, I said I mentioned three things: buying a non-necessity with money you owe to somebody else. Okay, so you're not necessarily, you know, using a credit card. So I have bought something, let's say, a store that gives you credit. Okay, and I owe them money. Or I borrowed money from you. I wasn't, you know, destitute. Jesus said, you know, lend without asking um, back. 
if you're lending this to somebody who is, who is very poor, then yeah, if they can't pay you back, you accept that. Now, Jesus didn't say borrow without any thought of paying back. He didn't put it that way. Uh, but that's how it seems like a certain number of people take it. Yeah, I borrow, I make a promise to, to pay this back. And then when the, I have some money where I could pay it back, and it's like, you know, I'd like to eat out today. Or, I, yeah, I need a new cell phone. I, I, whatever. And so you spend that money buying a non-necessity. Again, I'm not talking about you don't have any food in your refrigerator. I'm not even talking about, you know, no gas in your car. You know, things like that. Just something you don't have to have. You know, junk food, eating out, fast food. You, you know, like I say, the latest... Um, uh, nicety that there might be when you owe money to someone else. Now, the principle I was raised on is if I borrowed money from, from you, when I got my money, okay, I had the right to use what I had for necessities. I wasn't expected to starve. Everything else is your money. I don't have any right to spend that. It's your money. I mean, I told you I would pay you back. If I use your money... The way I'm, I was raised, I'm not, I'm not saying this is necessarily God's law. I'm stealing from you. I mean, you know, you didn't give me permission to do that. I don't have to spend that money. I'm just taking your money that's pledged to you, and I'm, I'm spending it on something I don't have to have. So I, I worked for this guy. He was not a Christian for a number of years when I was uh, like 19, 20 and yeah, he, he, he couldn't pay his electric bill, couldn't, I mean, he's making, you know, plenty of money to, to support a small family. He's a family of four. Uh, but yeah, owed, owed the, his boss money, owed, and so I would go, you know, with him. We, it was a door-to-door sale, so we would be out for a while. And, you know, I'd always bring a brown probably don't even know what a brown paper sack is. They hardly exist anymore, but it's something you got at the grocery store. And, you know, I'd make myself some sandwiches, put an apple in there, whatever, you know, and uh, had a thermos. And, and um, yeah, that would be, you know, my supper. Or, uh, usually we were working over, over the supper period. You know, just while I was in the car, I'd, that, that would be my supper. Yeah, he was always eating out. It was always, I mean, I'd say two meals a day. Didn't have money to pay back the people he owed, but he had money to eat out. And I finally just said something. I said, you know, because, I mean, I was aware of his problem because he's always talking about it, you know. I said, you know, why are you eating out when you owe people money? I mean, have you ever thought if, if you just didn't eat out, you could start maybe paying some of these people back? <sighs> well, if what this meal, his reply was, well, what if what this meal costs would get me out of my debt? Yeah, I wouldn't eat out. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, it's not the cost of that meal. It's that meal and the one you had at lunch, and it's the meal you're going to have tomorrow, and the meal you're going to have the next day, and, and so on. It was just, it's like, yeah, you cut all of those things out, then you can pay people the money that you owe them, that you have made a commitment to, to pay them. And I would just suggest... You know, I think that's being covetous, that, you know, you're getting something you don't have to have, and it's with somebody else's money. You're basically robbing them, and if that's not covetous, then again, it's a sin that doesn't exist. Having three, number three, having to get whatever the world entices us to buy, even if we can afford it. Now, here it gets so gray because... You know, I, there's no way to put a parameter here. I mean, if you've got the money, you know, I think you have the right to buy something you don't necessarily have to have. Now, you maybe you're going to give an accounting on Judgment Day. You, you probably will, how you used your money and didn't use it. But if we're always just having to get, you know, what the world entices us, and the business of manufacturers and uh, merchandisers is to make you dissatisfied with what you have. See, they don't like Hebrews. No, that passage in Hebrews, you know, be satisfied with what you have. 
Yeah, I mean, yeah, no, no company is going to put out that slogan, be satisfied with what you have. But yeah, their job and the job of advertisers is to make you dissatisfied with what you have. You're driving that car? Well, this is what you need to be driving. You know, you're using that cell phone? Well, this is what you need to have. Wow, the latest one has this and that, and you can do whatever. Whatever it is, make you dissatisfied with, with what you have so that, you know, you're even willing to spend money you don't have. But even if you have the money, yeah, is that the best use of it? Now, again, gray area here. There's, there is no way um, that uh, I'm going to try to define what that is. Jesus said, take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. So it's just a thought to think about, okay, am I just accumulating and accumulating things I don't have to have? Could that go to everlasting storing up treasures in heaven by, by helping people who do have need? Now, I feel very blessed that, that you know, way back uh, uh, fairly early in our marriage, Deborah and I gave up television, because um, television, you were just constantly assailed by ads. Well, you need this, you need to get this, and, and, and that to make you unhappy with what, with what you had. Magazines were that way. I'm glad magazines in some ways have, have kind of disappeared. I, it's sad in certain respects, but again, just what, you know, they paid for what they had to, some, something had to bring the revenue, and it wasn't the subscriptions. That didn't cover the whole cost of a magazine. It, the, most of the revenue came from ads. So, yeah, ads to make you unhappy with what you had. You can get that today with catalogs. I mean, I find I've got to be real careful. Like a, how many of you know what Layman's is? Uh, okay, you, you know, you can get one of those catalogs, and yeah, I, I mean, they know how to write everything to to make it just sound like wow, this is what you you've got to have. And, and there's nothing. I'm not criticizing them for for that, but. Yeah, I read it more just for entertainment because I'm not the one who does the, the shopping. So it's unlikely I'm going to actually get um, attracted to buy something. And again, I'm not saying it's a sin to. I'm, I'm just saying you could very easily just get into a thing where, yeah, because they're going to try to make you want things you don't have to have. I'd encourage you to learn to go to a store to buy a specific thing or a specific group of things and not just to shop. Just, uh, I mean, stores must hate me. And this doesn't come from any virtue on my part. It's just, it's just the way I am. I don't, I don't like spending time in stores. I don't like shopping. So, yeah, when I go in, I'm going in to get something. I don't even notice anything around me. I'm just, I mean, I'm always afraid when I walk into Lowe's, they're, they're going to make an announcement. Uh, David Brousseau just walked in. All the, all the uh, floor personnel can take their break now, you know. Because, <laughs> yeah, I'm... I'm <laughs> I could walk right by a display that said, you know, buy one DeWalt drill, get 10 free. And I, I never even noticed. I, I mean, <laughs> and, and again, I'm not saying this anything virtuous on my part. I'm just saying it's just, it's the way I am. I'm, I'm going there. I've got something. When Deborah was laid up in the hospital, she gave me these shopping lists. I go to the grocery store and yeah, I'm just going through crossing off. I don't know what I was walking by that I might have wanted to get. It just... And I'm saying, I don't, I'm not saying you have to be like that, but I'm saying if you're having trouble spending beyond your means or not being able to give as much to the kingdom as you, you would like, you might want to, you know, develop that, that kind of just go in with a list and this is what I'm going to get. And I'm going to look at what else is out there that they're trying to entice me to get. If you don't need something, it's not a good deal. It doesn't matter how cheap it is. If it's 50% discount, if you don't need it, and I mean, and it's not something that's going to really give you any kind of, you know, enrichment of your life, then, yeah, I, I would say forget it, you know, if you didn't walk in there for that. And one last thing, this isn't covetous, but it's for all of us, consider the effect on others of the things that we own. In other words, I may be free from being covetous. I'm satisfied with what I have. I don't spend, you know, I don't buy things that I, I don't have the money to already pay for them. But I also need to think about my brother. So, 
And, and this is the part, it's, it's definitely gray, but yeah, am I going to make my brother feel dissatisfied? Um, that's his sin, but yeah, if I've, if I've got all the, the latest this and that's and my brother doesn't, uh, yeah, how, how, what effect will that have on him? It's something to think about. I'm not going to, again, dwell there. Well, we're going to end on this note. Why does God condemn covetousness so strongly? So what is, what's the big thing? Okay, so we've talked about certain things that likely constitute covetousness, and there's plenty of other things beyond that. I'm just giving you some things. That I think you're getting at the edge of the cliff or you're off the cliff. But why does he say you will not inherit the kingdom if you, if you have this problem of covetousness? Well, I think one reason is it was the original sin. Covetousness was the original sin before Adam and Eve sinned on the part of Satan. You know, we don't know exactly what he was covetous about. Um, uh, some feel he wanted to be God. He, was, he, he coveted the position of the father. He wanted to be the ruler of the universe. Others think he was covetous of the son of God because Satan was an angel. He was a creature, and the son of God is not a creature. So he was, he was jealous. There was somebody else other than the father, and he wasn't at that level. Something he was covetous of man. We don't know what he was covetous. The only thing we know is he wasn't happy with what he had. And, and so... Sin entered the whole universe because one being was covetous, wasn't satisfied with what he had, had to have something more, wanted more than what he had, and everybody has, has paid the, the uh, price ever since. Covetousness has been the cause of most wars, I'd say most thefts and burglary, countless other evils. I want something that's not mine, that someone else has, and I'm going to just take it. If, if they don't give it to me, I'm just going to take it from them. And, and that would be most wars. Like I say, so, so much evil has happened because of covetousness. But there's something even more beyond that. God says that those who covet won't inherit the kingdom of God because unless, with God's help, we rid ourselves of covetousness while we're here on earth, in other words, if we haven't solved the problem now, if we're still covetous here on earth at the end of our life, heaven is going to be eternal torment for us. In other words, if you aren't content here, don't imagine that, oh, when I get to heaven, I'm going to be all content. Satan was in heaven. He was not content. That it's going to be eternal torment. Heaven is not going to be equality. That's the, that's the word today, the buzzword for everything. Jesus has already told us the rewards are not going to be equal. We're not going to all get the same reward. We're not all going to have the same levels of authority in heaven. That's just we humans who, who will be in the kingdom of heaven. But then there's angels, there's archangels, there's cherubs, there's seraphs. We don't even know all these other creatures, and they're, they're not all in the same order. There's going to be people, no matter who we are in heaven. There's going to be people above us. There'll probably be people below us. Um, but we're not all going to be on the same level. So if I'm not happy unless I have got the same thing you have, if I'm going to covet that you've got something more than, than I've got, then I'm not going to be happy in heaven. It's going to turn heaven into hell. In other words, you're going to sit there, you're going to be in eternal torment. Because forever. It's going to be that way. It's not like, oh yeah, next year you're going to climb up the ladder. No, there is never going to be equality in heaven. God is always going to be supreme. There's always going to be the son who is, the, the father is always going to be his head. And then there, under the son, you know, we have the Holy Spirit. Then we have the creatures, the angels. And like I say, there's all these different levels. So if you can't accept that, that others are going to have a greater privilege than you have. They're going to have greater whatever than you have. Heaven is not is going to be no place you're going to be happy. You're just going to be miserable there, and God is not going to have that. Covetousness, we've seen the effects once. One being who wasn't happy with his position caused all this evil. He, he, it's not going to happen again in heaven. If you're covetous, 
God does not want you there because, you know, you don't fit there, number one. Number two, you are going to be miserable. And, you know, you might as well go where you will be miserable because, you know, you're going to be, like I say, either way, you're going to be miserable. So, so that's, you know, that is what the universe, the rule of the universe. So what it boils down to is we got to get hold of the problem now to uh, be content with what we have. And that's why covetousness is a deadly sin. Why we can't inherit the kingdom of heaven. It's not just God, well, I'm going to be strict and mean with you, you know. It's like, you're going to be miserable here. You don't, don't even think about coming here to heaven. You're going to be miserable. You've already shown that. You've lived on earth. You've had more than you've needed, and you've been unhappy there. You've wanted more. You know, we're not going to bring that. We're not going to pollute heaven with, with, with that kind of uh, person. 